Welcome back. Let's continue. Now that we know about the fluid and electrolyte distributions in the body, let us talk about water movements between compartments at the capillary microcirculation level. This is the area where significant fluid exchanges happen. Generally, fluid exchanges occur because of two pressures at work hydrostatic pressure due to the water volume and osmotic or oncotic pressure. At the arterial end of the capillary, water tends to move out into the interstitial space because the hydrostatic pressure is higher than that at the venous end. As blood reaches the venous end, the capillary pressure dramatically decreases. So water moves back into the capillary. Please note that this fluid movement is between the intravascular and interstitial parts of the ECF. Fluid exchange between the ICF and ECF happens between cells and interstitial part of the ECF. Passive and active mechanisms control fluid exchange at this level. Passive exchanges happen generally through osmosis. Active exchanges occur through the sodium-potassium pump. In the latter, water goes in and out together with sodium. From the interstitial space, water may find its way into the circulation. To avoid accumulation of water in the interstitial space, the body returns extra fluid back to the circulatory system by way of the lymphatic system. Any problem returning fluid to the circulatory system could lead to edema in various parts of the body. So now we have finished talking about fluid compartments and the general mechanisms of fluid exchanges in the body. Let us move to water balance. How does our body generally handle water balance? Our body is able to ideally match water input with water output. Water input includes direct consumption of food and liquids and production of water through metabolic reactions in the body. To maintain the normal plasma osmolality of 250 to 300 milliosmoles, we need to drink about 20 hundreds milliliters of water every day. Water output, on the other hand, includes elimination of water through urination and defecation, perspiration during exercise, and insensible losses through the skin and lungs. In the following discussion, we will consider physiologic mechanisms that try to maintain water balance in the body. Why do we have to drink every now and then? This is because we are thirsty, of course. But what causes this feeling? It all starts when our plasma ECF osmolality increases and when plasma volume decreases. Both stimuli send signals to the thirst center in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then in turn sends signals for us to drink. After drinking, water eventually gets absorbed in a small intestine. From there, water moves into the circulatory system, so the plasma volume is increased 
and the ECF osmolality is brought down to a normal level. This is the first mechanism. Another mechanism involves the antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Osmol regulators in the hypothalamus cause the release of this hormone. Once released, ADH stimulates water reabsorption and the collecting ducts of the nephrons. Water is returned to the circulatory system to help normalize the blood osmolarity. Both mechanisms work under negative feedback principle. Other hormones are also involved in regulating water balance in the body. For example, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system start to work when renal blood flow through the kidneys is decreased. And this stimulates the juxture glomerular apparatus to secrete renin. Renin then causes activation of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by the angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin 2 functions to conserve salt and water by increasing sympathetic activity, promoting tubular reabsorption of sodium chloride and water, but elimination of potassium, as well as increasing secretion of aldosterone. With conservation or retention of water and salt, circulating volume in the body increases. This is presented as an increase in perfusion to the juxta glomerular apparatus. Through negative feedback, release of renin eventually decreases. Another hormone related to water and salt balance is the atrial natriuretic peptide, AMP. AMP is released when the atria are stretched due to increased blood volume and pressure. AMP causes a decreased secretion of renin, ADH, and aldosterone. The overall effects ultimately result in increased excretion of sodium and water, and therefore blood volume and pressure decreases. When the body is unable to acquire or retain water, dehydration occurs. Severe dehydration could cause lethargy, low blood pressure, tachycardia, and an increase in body temperature. Just to name a few, fluid and electrolyte replacement must be provided to restore patients to their normal states. And this is the story of Miss Lee. She has a great loss of water and electrolytes because the watery diarrhea. Administration of a solution containing salts and glucose is effective to replenish her losses. Opposite to dehydration, is a condition known as edema. Edema happens if there is retention of fluid in tissues and other spaces of the body. It may be due to infectious and non-infectious causes. Common non-infectious causes are of cardiac and renal origins. Investigation of the causes of edema is important to provide appropriate management. Hypernatremia and hyponatremia are imbalances in sodium concentration. The common forms are due to isotonic fluid excess or deficit 
both conditions are need appropriate management as they could have neurological consequences. Now, you should understand why knowledge of intravenous fluids is important in managing patients. Intravenous fluid vary in the concentration of electrolytes and non-electrolytes and are used to manage various fluid and solid imbalances. In summary, water and solids in the body are distributed in intracellular and extracellular compartments. A good balance of fluid and electrolytes within compartments is important for normal body functioning at the unseen levels of the body organization, histologic, cellular, and molecular. The volume and composition of extracellular fluid is carefully regulated by various mechanisms, but especially by the kidneys. For further reading, you can check the references listed towards the end of this session. And next time, we'll talk about basic acid-base balance. Thank you, and see you next time.